Epicurus, a famous Stoic philosopher, once said, Be with people who lift you up, whose presence brings out your best qualities. People often say, you're the average of the five people you spend the most time with. So, let's look at that idea through the eyes of a Stoic today. We'll talk about the ten types of people who can stop you from learning Stoicism and why it's important to rethink your friendships with them. Please let me know if you would like the video before we start. This will help me keep spreading the Stoic mindset. I suggest that you subscribe and turn on the bell so you don't miss any movies if you aren't already. These are 10 kinds of people you should stay away from. Type number one, the complainer. There's always that one friend, family member, or neighbor who can find something wrong with everything, like the weather, their job, or even the food at a popular restaurant. They never pass up a chance to say how unhappy they are. You might be wondering why this matters to me. I can just not care about them. That's not so easy to do, though. Being around this kind of criticism on a regular basis can be hard on your mental health. It's like a tap that leaks. Your mental energy is slowly being used up. Stoicism tells us to stop dwelling on problems and instead focus on things we can do to fix them. Imagine working on a project with someone who always has something bad to say. Every meeting ends up being a long time of complaining. Without helpful conversation, the team's morale drops and you lose focus on finding answers that can be put into action. You'll probably become less and less interested in the job and maybe even in life in general. Let us pretend you are working at your company on a big project to help you picture it and you work with someone, let's call him Alex, who always has something bad to say. Alex always seems to bring up the bad things about the project when there is a meeting. Everything from the stress of the work plan to problems with organization. At first, you might try to listen to Alex and give him support. Alex's constant negativity, on the other hand, starts to lower the mood of the whole team over time. It gets stressful and hard to work together in meetings, and everyone is tired after each work session. From the point of view of stoic thought, you can handle this by following some rules. Start by thinking about what you can change. You can't change what Alex thinks or does, but you can change how you feel and what you think. Instead of letting Alex make things worse, focus on getting better at your job. The next challenge, thoughts of harm. Alex's bad feelings might not be true or might not be important. Try to change your mind about those ideas and see the good things about the project. Lastly, make a good atmosphere by thinking stoically and having a good mood. You have the power to change the work group and make the workplace a better place to be. Stoicism is not about changing other people. It's about how you handle and respond to the things going on around you. This helps you keep a good attitude and think about answers instead of getting caught up in other people's bad mood. How does Stoicism help us deal with someone who is always complaining? You can use a number of different methods. First, try to spend less time with this person whenever you can, if that's not possible, maybe because they're related or work with you. Then your second choice is to mentally separate yourself from them while they complain. Think of their complaints as a passing storm that is loud and unsettling, but only lasts for a short time and can't move the rock that is your own inner peace. The third thing you can do is bring up solutions or change the topic to something more positive. As Marcus Harris said, you control your mind, not what happens in the outside world. If you understand this, you will be strong. Stoic wisdom tells us to protect our mental peace and make sure that the negativity of people who always complain doesn't take us off our inner road of strength and virtue. Type number two, the drama magnet. Picture yourself steering your life like a ship going through calm water. Then you come across the whirlpool known as the drama magnet. This person seems to be involved in a lot of problems and crises all the time. Like a whirlpool, they can pull you into their chaos, which can be very upsetting. At first, you might be drawn to the drama magnet's energy, thinking it was passion or excitement. You'll quickly learn, though, that being in their area is like steering a ship through a storm, very tiring and dangerous. 
Dealing with drama from people who are in the way is hard because pressing situations often make you feel like they're your own. Their chaos can spread and you might get involved in fights you weren't supposed to be a part of at first. Take a look at an example. One of your friends often has disagreements with other people in your group. Suppose you have a friend in the group named Sarah. Sarah recently got into a heated argument with someone in the group about something. The argument between Sarah and a few other people in the group turned into a major fight. The other people in the group didn't seem to agree with Sarah, which made her look very angry and unhappy. She complains and attacks the other people in the group a lot, and she seems very upset about it. It's now getting hard for you to stay in this group because you feel pressure and stress. Sarah brings up these problems a lot, and it doesn't look like she'll stop. They stay at the top of talks and group meetings. You've talked to Sarah, tried to settle disagreements, and given her advice, but nothing has worked to solve the problem. And you haven't been able to change Sarah's mind or make things less tense. You can follow stoic principles and stay away from Sarah's bad feelings by using a method called thoughtful listening. Instead of trying to convince Sarah or getting involved in the fight, you can think about what she says without passing judgment. For instance, if Sarah complains that other people don't agree with her, you could say that their difference makes you angry, right, in this way. You stay out of the fight and don't make things worse. But you still show Sarah that you understand and care about how she feels. However, if Sarah keeps up the conflict and you feel like being in this group is no longer in line with your mood and goals, you can also use the last strategy described in the passage, which is now selectively unavailable. You might need to temporarily separate yourself from the group or look for things and people that are more in line with your mood. Stoicism tells us to value our time very highly, and that can mean not being available for other people's problems, especially if they keep happening without getting better. During certain times, turn off your phone, establish times when you will only work on your project or improve yourself, and let people know that they should not bother you during these times. To borrow a phrase from Seneca, to be truly happy is to enjoy the moment without worrying about what will happen in the future. This can be especially helpful when working with people who like to cause trouble. Instead of worrying about what crisis will happen next, focus on the here and now, where you have power. Have fun with your life, and don't let someone else's problems upset you. Be sure to sail your ship quietly and stay away from whirlpools. That could get in the way of your journey to peace and personal growth. Type number three, the unfavorable person. Think about this. That's you, an artist, creating a picture. Every stroke of the brush gives your picture more color, depth, and life. Here comes the doubter. They come into your office, take a quick look at your work, and then start criticizing it right away. Are you sure that color is right? That doesn't seem possible. It's funny, but most artists never finish their work. Their words are just rough lines of gray paint. Start to make your bright surface dull. This isn't the usual kind of helpful feedback. Instead, it's an air of uncertainty and negativity that won't go away. Take the example of being excited about starting a new job. When you tell other people how excited you are, you've done your homework, talked to experts, and maybe even taken some beginning classes. They quickly make a list of all the reasons why it might not work. Too many people are in the market. Do you have the right skills? What if you fail so quickly that your worries become your own and your once strong vision starts to waver? But don't let the mean words beat you or make you doubt yourself. Do not accept doubt and agree with those who have it. Instead, try a different method. Think about things like, why is the market so competitive? If I have trouble, can I get better at this task so I can face it? Should I learn from my mistakes and fail to get better? So instead of just focused on the bad things, you can get them to think about finding solutions and ways to get through tough situations. The important thing is to keep believing in your own skills and not let other people's questions make you less determined to reach your goals. How do you deal with someone who doesn't believe in you especially if they're close to you. 
Asking them for help instead of just telling them about your plans or goals is an unusual but effective way to get what you want. When someone is an advisor, they are less likely to say bad things about your ideas and may give you more useful comments. Using a practice called positive confrontation to change the script is another way to do it. Instead of taking in their bad vibes, ask them to come up with ideas. Counter with an interesting point of view if they say you can't change jobs at this point. What do you think are the best ways for someone to change careers? Not only does this deflect the negative, but it also leads to a more positive talk. In your mind, remember what the Stoic teacher Epictetus said. We can listen twice as much as we talk because we have two ears and one mouth. Listening doesn't mean taking in everyone's bad mood, figuring out what is useful information and what is just noise. When people who don't believe in you start to paint a picture of doubt over your work, back up a bit. Type number four, the toxic positivist. You know the person who always sends out rainbows, sunshine, and a never-ending stream of emojis. They are the ones telling you to be happy when things are bad, ignoring your thoughts and feelings with a careless wave of shiny positivity. Think of your life as a garden. There are flowers, but there are also weeds and bugs. A poisonous positivist, on the other hand, won't see anything that isn't a rose in bloom. You have bugs on your leaves. They would tell me to just look at the flowers. Even though it sounds positive, the way they do things can make you feel rejected and cut off from reality. Let's say you're having a hard time with a breakup. You're sad, confused, and trying to find mental balance. Going through a breakup can be one of the hardest things that can happen to you. During these times, you may feel hurt, lost, and even heartbroken after the breakup. It can be very annoying and unreasonable to follow the advice of a toxic positivist. There are lots of fish in a big sea, feel good and smile. In a larger sense, this statement may make sense and be true, but it doesn't take into account the pain and problems you're going through right now. After a breakup, you might feel like you've lost a part of yourself, and telling yourself to smile and live happily isn't always helpful. This kind of over-the-top positivity doesn't take into account how complicated feelings are and how real life is. Not every day is a happy one, and we have to deal with sad, angry, or let-down feelings like loss and disappointment. These things happen naturally and can't be stopped in life and self-condemnation, because having these feelings makes the pain worse. We don't have to hide our bad feelings and only think about the good ones. Instead, we can learn to face them accept them, and think about how they can help us learn and grow. The important thing is to keep the good and the bad in balance, to have a more fair and realistic view of life. How can you take care of your yard without letting the harmful positive ists walk all over it with their random positive vibes? The only way to deal with them is to have a conversation that includes both light and dark. If they say, look on the bright side, at least you're healthy, you could say, yes, I'm thankful for my health. However, it's also fine for me to be upset about this problem. Both can live together. You can also use something psychologists call emotional granularity, which means being able to feel and tell the difference between a lot of different feelings, both good and bad. When the toxic optimist tells you to just be happy, Name and recognize the different ways you feel. I'm feeling a little down today for some reason, and that's fine. As an affirmation of Stoic thought, Seneca once said, True happiness is to know our duties toward God and man so that we can enjoy the present without worrying about the future. Look at the balance. Knowing that you have responsibilities that aren't always fun and savoring the present moment, Focusing only on the good or the bad isn't part of a reserved attitude. It's about being calmly accepting of how complicated life is. Just remember to step back the next time a toxic positivist throws confetti on your well-kept yard. Remember that a plant needs both sun and rain to grow, and let all of your feelings flow through you. Keep giving your garden the care it needs to become as rich and complicated as it can be. Type number five, the victim. 
Life could be thought of as a game of chess, where everyone has the same pieces and the goal is to checkmate the other player's king. You plan your moves, give up things you want, and sometimes take risks. The target, on the other hand, blames the chessboard, the pieces, or even the other player for every mistake they make. They think they are always in checkmate, but it's not their choice. Something outside of them is working against them. They are the helpless main character in their own story of pain that will never end. This comparison helps us see how each of us deals with problems and makes choices in this game. Every player starts with the same pieces and the same goal. Moving chess pieces on a board is a lot like how we need to think about and plan our moves. To reach our goals, we have to sometimes give up things and take risks that we know are safe. How people deal with failures and problems, on the other hand, is what separates those who achieve from those who fail. When the target faces problems or fails, they always try to blame something outside of themselves, like the chessboard, the pieces, or even their opponent. They don't take responsibility for what they do or decide because they think someone else is always working against them. Because of this, they always feel like they are in checkmate. The victim's life often turns into a never-ending story of pain, with the victim as the main character and no way to stop it. They don't see that they have options and can decide what will happen to them. Successful people, on the other hand, know that life may throw them problems and things they can't change, but how they react and choose their next steps in the game of life decides their fate in the end. The important thing is to understand that everyone has problems and fails in life. There are also things outside of us that can have an effect on us, which makes a difference is how we handle and learn from these events. There are things we can't always change, but how we react and choose our next move in life decides our fate in the end. It's important to recognize that some people really do have hard times and structural problems but the victim we're talking about always uses their situation as an excuse. You might get caught up in their story, maybe as the supporting character who always needs to save them because you won't take responsibility for their actions or lack of actions. Let's say you've spent hours listening to a friend complain about how all of their bad relationships were their fault. This not only takes up your time, but it may also gently make you feel like a victim in your own life. What should you do when you come across a victim, especially if they are someone close to you? One unusual but successful way is to ask them open-ended questions that make them think about what's going on. Instead of giving them answers or fixing all of their problems, ask them things like, What do you think you could do differently in this situation? Or, How do you plan to take charge of this part of your life? You could also be understanding and kind but don't try to save them from problems they need to solve on their own. Be there for them and listen, but don't take on all of their problems. In your mind, remember what the Stoic scholar Epicurus said, being different from the person who did you wrong is the best way to get back at them. You should fight the urge to become the victim if you find yourself getting caught up in their story. In the chess game of life, being stuck in checkmate all the time is often a choice, not a fate. Move the pieces and take charge of your own board. Move your pieces forward. Give up things strategically when you have to, and don't play for revenge or sympathy. Play for growth and knowledge. Type number six, the time vampire. Think of your daily life as a well-balanced symphony. Each instrument stands for a responsibility or job, and when they are all played together, they make a perfect balance. Then the time vampire joins in, screaming off key, drowning out the tune, and stopping the flow of the music that is your life. There are people called time vampires who always want your time and attention without giving you much in return. You might have a friend who always calls you to have long, boring chats that keep you tired and behind schedule, or a co-worker who always calls you to talk about unimportant things, which makes you miss deadlines. Time. Vampires do more than just take your time. They make it hard to concentrate, get work done, and relax in order to deal with time vampires. It's important to be clear about your limits and availability. 
Be polite but strong when telling them when you're available for calls or meetings and when you need to focus on work without interruptions. Tell them to be as careful with your time as you are with theirs. You could also try changing their requests to include better or more useful ways to communicate. For instance, if a friend likes to talk on the phone for long periods of time without getting anywhere, suggest that they use text messages or emails for short reports or questions. You can get back control of your time and keep it from slipping away if you do this. To build on the example of a friend who often makes long, pointless phone calls, we can better understand how to use a strategy to manage our time and stay productive in our daily lives by suggesting that we switch to shorter, more concise text messages or emails as a better way to talk. You not only save time, but you also make it easier for both people to talk to each other. Changing the way you talk to people can help you in many ways. For starters, it gives you more control over your time by letting you connect whenever it's convenient for you. You don't have to take long, pointless calls that you might not want to or can't answer right away. That way, you can read and answer emails or text messages when you're ready. Second, sending text messages or emails as a way to talk can lead to stronger and more useful conversations. You can organize your thoughts into short, clear messages that make it easier for the other person to understand and reply quickly. This makes it easier to share information and wastes less time than having long, boring talks. On top of that, using this method of contact can make it easier to talk about and solve certain problems. You can focus on the most important questions and requests, and the other person can give you accurate answers without having to have long conversations. This helps both people make the most of their time and make sure that jobs are done faster. By using this strategy, you can take back control of your time and keep working efficiently in your daily life by suggesting a better way to communicate in a polite and sensible way. It's a good thing that you're making things easier for your friends and yourself. Knowing what you can control and what you can't is a big part of the stoic mindset. Time vampires will often try to take over your time and attention, but you can regain control by setting limits and planning how you spend your time. In your mind, remember what the Stoic philosopher Seneca said, we don't lack time, we just lose a lot of it. It's important for your personal and Stoic growth to hang out with people who make you feel good and share your values. Type number seven, the manipulator. Think of your life as a story for a movie. You are the main character, and you know how the story should go, including where the turns should be and who your friends and guides should be. You also know what your final act should look like. Here comes the manipulator. A shady director who changes your script in a sneaky way that you don't even notice until you wake up one day and find that the plot has gone off track. The trickster knows how to use emotions or thoughts to get what they want. They could charm you, make you feel bad, or even lie to you to get you to do what they want. If someone always gets you to pay for dinner, they might say something like, You know, I've been having a rough month and you're so successful. You wouldn't notice, but it would make my day better in the long run. It turns out that someone took advantage of your kindness. It's hard to call them out, though because they said it was a favor for a friend in need. It can be hard to deal with a liar. Some experts say that fogging is one way to stop them from doing what they're doing. This method involves agreeing with the liar about any truth in what they say, but not giving in to emotional pressure. They should pay for dinner if they say you're so great. You could answer with, Yes, I have been doing well, but let's split the price like we always do. Another option is to make clear rules and stick to them. If the trickster wants you to give them money or do things you don't want to do, don't do them. Be sure to say no when you need to. Be cool and make sure your words are clear. I can't lend you money, but I'm here to help you feel better. Makes clear limits while still being friendly. Get ideas from the way Stoics think. Epictetus told us to go. We can't change the things that happen to us, but we can always choose how to deal with them. The trickster loves it when you know what they're going to do next. They use your kindness, your guilt, or your need to be liked to get what they want. 
you're back in charge of your story when you choose a different response. In this case, if you think someone is trying to trick you, know that you have the power. You are the one who writes your story. There may be a lot of different characters in the cast, but the main character's journey and your journey should always be based on your ideals and choices. Take back control of your story and don't let anyone change it. Type number eight, the overconsumer. The eighth type of person you should stay away from is someone who likes to overindulge. One of the ideas behind stoicism is moderation. And for many people, accumulating these ideas does not solve their problems. Seneca said that it only changes them. People who like to eat and drink too much are always looking for happiness, which can hurt them. Their lack of self-control can make a whirlwind that is hard to control, whether it's with food, material things, or any other luxury. I'd like to use Jacques as an example of someone who likes to overindulge, he often spends a lot of money shopping, often goes to expensive parties, and often eats at fancy places. Jack is always looking for happiness and pleasure by shopping and eating tasty food. He spent too much money on things that weren't necessary, and he often stays up late to do expensive things. For this case, Jack is a person who likes to consume too much. The kind of person that Stoic thought says you should not be. Having a lot of things and using them all the time gives him pleasure and happiness, usually things or events that are too expensive. He can't control himself when it comes to his money, time, and energy because of this. The stoic way of thinking stresses balance, moderation, and putting more importance on spiritual ideals than material ones. They think that the only way to be truly happy is to know our limits and live an honest, self-controlled life. Jack can learn to focus on spiritual joys and rein in his greed and overconsumption, which will help him find real balance and happiness. The Stoic Way of Life He knows that balance is the key to true happiness, not having too much or too little. It's about being aware of the world around you, enjoying the good things in life, and not buying too much. They find happiness in balance and self-control instead of hoarding or overindulging without thinking. They are aware that to reach a stable and good mental state, they need to be able to control themselves and deal with their own wants in a healthy way. Type number nine, the gossip. Because it's so easy and quick to talk to people these days, gossip is very common. These people spread lies without caring about the truth or the bad effects they might have. Spending time with them is like planting seeds of doubt and mistrust in your life. Marcus Aurelius said, Don't waste time arguing about what a good man should be. Be a one. To be a stoic, you have to strive for truth and ethics. Talking about other people takes you off track. It's important not only to stay away from talk, but also from people who don't follow these rules. In short, be wary of people who share stories and information that they haven't checked out and don't trust people who don't stand for morals and the truth. Let's say you work in a place that is both competitive and sensitive. The job was hard and important, and you're proud of how it turned out. After a short time, though, a co-worker tells you that bad things are being said about you and your work around the company. In this case, your co-worker is the one who spreads rumors. By sharing false and offensive information, They've made the workplace tense and led to misunderstandings about you and your work through taking part in this bad talk. The talk has hurt not only your mood at work, but also the atmosphere at work as a whole. Stoic philosophy says that in this case, you should stay true to yourself and not let rumors hurt your reputation or morals. Do good work and stay honest at work so that your values and truth shine through more than stories that you can't confirm. Type number 10, the Lord of Pessimism. The last person you should stay away from is the Lord of Pessimism. Some people might say that a cloudy sky is beautiful in its own way, but pessimists only see the possibility of rain. Their thoughts are like dark rooms that don't have any windows to let light in. Their only focus is on the bad things, and they can't see the chances that problems often present. 
we remember Marcus Aurelius. If you reject your feeling of being hurt, the hurt goes away. Let this show how important it is to have a different point of view. Stoic thought says that it's important to be optimistic, or at least have a balanced mind. Stoicism is not about what happens in the outside world, but how we think about it. That causes trouble. Do not hang out with people who are always negative. Life is a journey. Our paths are shaped by the people we know. Who wants someone to bring down their happiness when things are going well or make them feel bad when things are hard? Now, here's a quick test with these numbers. Have you met anyone new recently? Does someone in your life deal with them a lot? Write something below. I'm really interested in how to identify and avoid these 10 types of people. Stay away from them. You can keep your peace of mind. Keep your mind on what's important and walk your stern path with strength and virtue. Thanks for seeing it. Also, if you liked this movie, please like and subscribe to help us keep looking into Stoic philosophy. By following the Stoic ideals, you are part of a group of people who are all looking for wisdom, courage, and a good life.